Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing fostering grassroots action to strengthen civil society, advance justice and equality, and move people from disempowered margins into places of power with our very special guest, Shane Murphy Goldsmith, President and CEO, and Julio Marcial, Senior Vice President of Programs of the Liberty Hill Foundation, no, just a wonderful organization. Thank you so much, Shane. Thank you so much, Julio, for being with us and, and advancing this discussion. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having us. Yes, thank you. So Liberty Hill, we've we've had a, a previous interview, Shane, um, uh, cur- courtesy of KCLS in Los Angeles to talk about the work of Liberty Hill. And it's one of the things, you know, given all the changes that we've gone through with COVID and and shutdowns and and uh, some of our, our our politics and what the dialogue that is uh, festering um, in in our uh, society. Um, there have been a lot. We've all gone through a, a, an awful lot. Uh, talk a little bit about Liberty Hill's mission, um, how the organization was founded, and then uh, Julio, it would be great for you to jump in and talk about the programmatic articulation of that mission and, and how you actually work with people. Shane. Okay, that was about 10 questions in one, so I'll try to, get, try to tackle them all. So the first question about sort of the last few years of um, massive upheaval, including COVID and the racial justice uprising and everything else, that really held up a mirror to American society about the inequities and injustices that Liberty Hill Foundation and our community partners have been fighting against for many, many, many years. And there continues to be this sort of gaslighting effect where we all know it's happening and people of color, low income folks, other folks living on the margins live this every day and talk about it openly. And yet people can close their eyes and pretend it's not happening because maybe it's not happening to them. Um, But COVID and the the George Floyd murder, all of that really laid bare these inequities and injustices. And as horrific as that period was, I think the the silver lining is that grassroots folks who have been impacted by these same inequities and injustices for many years were ready with the solutions, solutions that they've been fighting for and innovating for many, many years, and folks just really wouldn't listen. Um, But for example, the issue around tenants um, came to the forefront and the, the whole country saw that tenants were in an incredibly vulnerable position. And in fact, tenancy, is a very vulnerable position to be in. And so there were our community partners, activists and organizers on the front lines in partnership with Liberty Hill and our donors and funders were able to win tenant protections that we've been fighting for for many, many years, but we're finally able to win them during COVID because everybody could see what a vulnerable population it was and that it was in everyone's self-interest to protect them. So let's not put too fine a point on it. Let's be very blunt. People who are poor and lived in the in the uh, live in the inner cities, and who often are of color, died at higher rates during COVID than those who um, who were white um, and had money. Right? It was poverty, yes, but it, poverty aligns to race and became very very clear who was most impacted. People who became homeless to exacerbate the homeless crisis. It fell along income lines, but also racial lines, right? Let's not put too fine a point on the fact that jobs were affected at the at the lower end of employment way, way worse than at the higher end of, of compensation of, of employment. So these, these problems that we've been talking about for a long time became actual blunt statistics during COVID because of COVID, right, Julio? Yes. I mean, I think what you just shared just exacerbated the significant divide of how issues impact uh, folks of color. So when you talk about housing, when you talk about the environment, when you talk about public health, I mean, if you just think about COVID in general, you think about the investment or lack thereof in in public health. And, you know, we were exposed. And yet who was more exposed? Uh, Black, brown, native, indigenous communities, to your point, who were disproportionately dying, who were disproportionately being impacted by as Shane mentioned, um, t- you know, the lack of tenant protections and everything in between. So yeah, I agree that 
what this did was expose the significant divide that existed that, again, many of these communities were aware of. And yet um, the reality, of it, if you look at the headline, um, folks of color uh, bore the brunt of it. Now, I have a question for you both, because the American system, in theory, is one in which everybody has a chance to work their way up from the bottom to the top, right? It's supposed to be a meritocracy, right? And the idea of of creating so much support that that isn't required, okay, is anathema to that philosophy. So talk about that idea of working your way up and what the barriers are to uh, to working your way up and how you ensure that that, act- that actual sort of American philosophy of being able to build yourself up over generations is, is actually advanced because that is part of what you do. You're actually defending a value because there are artificial barriers to that ideal, right? Yes, yes, yes. So Liberty Hills North Star is to um, build power in communities that are most impacted by systemic oppression to achieve justice and equity. And so for us, it really comes down to power. Um, it is the power or the lack thereof that determines where you get where you are on that ladder and the degree to which you can climb up the ladder or not. And when massive you know, percentages of our communities are disempowered by law, by systems, by culture, uh, whether it's you know preventing black people from voting or poisoning the air that low-income immigrants breathe near USC or locking up children in cages for acting out the way, you know, locking up black girls in cages for behaving the exact same way a white boy could behave and never get in trouble. So these are all, there's so many ways we could go on and on that, that, you know, prevent people from moving up that ladder. And, but for us, it's really about power building. It's not about helping each individual climb the ladder. It's about addressing the underlying power dynamics. It's education. It's, it's, it's putting people on suspension because of how they wear their hair, right? It's, it's these kinds of aspects, right, Julio? Yeah. I mean, again, just to build off what Shane just mentioned, I think, look, I just had this conversation with my family, right? So they often look at the bootstraps mentality. If we just work hard, we're going to succeed. And when you do that, you fail to look at the system. So let me give you an example of what Shane just mentioned. We talk about, you know, education being the great equalizer. Yet I can tell you that in Los Angeles County, the top 10 zip codes where education is suffering, and yet we're actually funneling Black, Brown, Native, and Indigenous young people into the criminal legal system. Why? If you go into those zip codes, there's not an investment in education. But what you do see is an investment in law enforcement. So as Shane mentioned, you know, when you're living in a community that has been in concentrated poverty for 40 years, is that a fair opportunity to succeed, learn, and thrive when, in fact, there's been a lack in investment in transportation, in housing, in parks and recreation, in safety. And so that in itself is a systemic um, issue that oftentimes we don't talk about. And so what Shane and what I do at Liberty Hill is really talk about how do we really ensure that the system is fair? Well, that requires an investment in people power, in relationship power, governance power, and really mark the narrative, right? So I think what you're also lifting up, you know, you talked about the pandemic, you're talking about you know, um, you know, whatever it is, housing, the environment, it really is about the narrative and whether or not it's actually based on fact or not. So the reality is that many black, brown, young people do not have a fair chance to succeed, learn and thrive because of many of the systemic barriers that have been that have been built up so high that you're not able to see the masses of young people succeed. Again, I think about myself, you know, I came, I was born in this country, the only one in my family, five of my siblings didn't graduate high school. Uh, they came to this country undocumented, became documented, even when they became documented, couldn't get a job, couldn't navigate housing, rented their whole entire life, and basically have struggled in poverty since they've been in this country. My my experience is different, but that's the thing. It's not systemic. It's an exception to the rule. And we want to change that. So what you're what you're saying is, is that you you keep the hard work idea, right? But you then allow that hard work to gain traction 
by removing those systemic barriers. So let's talk about uh, the barriers that that uh, that we're talking about removing. Let's start with education. Um, uh, Shane, talk about uh, how you look at this whole idea of of helping people to gain the knowledge um, and the capabilities so that they can become, um, they have agency to affect their lives. They're not dependent on somebody else, even yourselves, even Liberty Hill Foundation to guide them. How do you foster independence through knowledge? Great question. Well, you know, we believe that that power comes in two forms, organized money and organized people. And grassroots folks, long-term folks, folks of color, the folks we work with every day, those folks have access to organized people, not so much organized money that we're up against the organized money opposition. So our work is all about people power and it's all about helping people to see that the conditions they're living in are a symptom of these systemic forces and really by design. Because, you know, I grew up super poor and there's a lot of shame that comes with that. There's a lot of pride too in our community and our family, of course, um, but there's a lot of shame and a lot of fear and a lot of self blame that comes with living in poverty and being surrounded by so much wealth and privilege. And, you know, I often think about my, how did my dad manage to get me to understand so young that these these conditions were symptoms of larger societal forces and they weren't our fault, they weren't his fault. Um, and I don't really know how he did it, except that I think he railed against the news every day and somehow I picked up on that. And plus I saw my dad, he was, you know, we were very poor, but he was brilliant and he was powerful and he was wise and he was kind. And so the images that I saw in the media about poor people and why we shouldn't be part of any any solution um, didn't make sense to me. And so that's really what we're about is finding those sort of community grown leaders throughout Los Angeles County who are leading in their communities already. They're bringing families together. You know, the, the work we did to ban oil drilling in Los Angeles all started because community members kids started getting sick and they built community around talk. What's happening to your kid? That my kid's happening too. The doctor doesn't know what it is. And so it's these informal networks of power that we can really, if we infuse with resources and bring folks together so they can talk about their challenges and see that, oh, wait a minute, if all of our kids are getting sick with undiagnosable things and we all live across the street from this machine that makes a loud noise every Thursday, you start to put it together. And in that way, you can build coalitions and campaigns that build power, not only to win the, 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 the fight, let's say around banning oil drilling, but to build power for the next fight. Because for example, we won the ban to oil drilling in Culver City, LA City, LA County, and now the oil industry is coming back with lawsuits and ballot measures. So the fight really never ends. And so we constantly have to be engaging folks to find their own power within themselves and join with others. Uh, to fight like hell. And the reality is they have everything to gain and everything to lose. So we don't need to tell them what to do. We don't we, uh, we don't obviously know what to do. We're not the folks directly impacted. We're not living in these communities. So we hand the resources to them and they change the world. So uh, Julio, one of the things that strikes me is that this story is very resonant in American history. If you take a look at the waves of Italian immigrants and what they were faced uh, with and the uh, discrimination that they were faced with, the the Irish immigrants who were also faced with waves of uh, discrimination, the Jewish immigrants, the uh, various Asian immigrants, the various Latin Hispanic immigrants, the story of disempowerment, acquiring knowledge, acquiring consciousness that that this isn't normal and it shouldn't be normal for next generations. Right, the the story that you told about about your family having an exception. And then dedicates the rest of their lives to ensuring that the exception becomes the rule. That's what you're. That's what you're talking about right here. Yeah, I mean, I think you you brought up um, education, and I think just you know to build off what we've been talking about, where if you really look at, I mean, let's remind ourselves, right? Segregation still was happening in the 1960s. We can do the math. That's less than that's 60 years ago, not 300 years ago, not 200 years ago, 60 years ago. So you think about what this country was enduring in the 60s and the 70s, right? right? When it came to educational systems. Well, let me tell you, let me fast forward to today. 
there's still a lot of disparity, right? And so what Liberty Hill has done is to fund organizations like Inner City Struggle and Community Coalition and Brother Son Selves who- So talk for, about what those organizations are doing. Where does your yeah, money the, go and what is it? what kind of impact? I'm looking at your impact report, by the way. Uh, kudos to you. Yeah. Talk about those mm-hmm. organizations that you're funding and talk about their impact. Yeah, and so let me just remind folks that again, we we understand that no one organization can do this on its own. Liberty Hill right. cannot do this on its own, and it does this in coalition and partnership. And I often say, and that there's no one answer, right? There is no one answer, and I think part, and, and I think this is how we have to show up at Liberty Hill Foundation because we're not just necessarily a grant maker, but we're a fundraiser, we're a convener, we hold spaces, we hold conversations, we connect people. But always going back to what, you know, Shane often talks about, which is around centering those that have been directly impacted. And we often say those that, you know, are closest to the pain should be closest to the power. And when we mean power, we mean policy and money and decision making about their own trajectory and in their own lives. Right. So, you know, when we when we talk about the educational piece and we talk about that segregation, you know, the, the work of you know segregation or desegregating in the 60s and the 70s. Think about the organizations and the coalitions that were a part of that black, brown led organizations who were who were being impacted and disenfranchised by laws. So 60 years later, you know, Liberty Hill for a very long time in its history has been supporting organizations that, again, are led by people who have been directly impacted by these systemic inequality. So on the education front, these organizations, Inner City Struggle, which is in the east side of Los Angeles, focused in Borough Heights and East Los Angeles, Community Coalition, who, again, founded by Karen Bass, who is now the mayor of Los Angeles in South L.A., where, again, you looked at how that Black students were being disenfranchised in the L.A. Unified School District, along with other folks, joined forces. But, but talk beyond the generality, sure. disenfranchised. Everybody's throwing around the same mm-hmm. terms. And at a certain point, the terms get in the way. So sure. talk about the specific yeah. um, uh, impacts that you've had to... Yeah. I'll what is not being disenfranchised actually mean? Yeah, I'll give you one example. The, you know, LA Unified, 10 years ago, um, a lot of kids were going to schools where you literally could not even take a, a, a course that would qualify to take you to the University of California system, right? So we know that many white kids on the West Side were afforded early opportunities in their schooling to literally follow a blueprint to get to the University of California system. That was not happening for black, brown students. So if I'm if I'm a kid going to one of those schools, I really am not going to be equipped to go to the University of California at all. Not I'm even not, equipped. I won't have the, the background. Not even equipped, not even eligible. Right. Not, not even eligible. So, so what's the situation now, 10 years later? 10 years later, now we have A to G requirements across LA Unified. And again, that is a result of grassroots people saying and demanding that they wanted a fair chance, right, to succeed, learn, and thrive. And I'll, I'll ask Shane to come in because, again, this precedes fantastic me a little bit. example, by the way, Julio. I mean, really fantastic. I mean, that is so concrete. Uh, Shane, do you have other examples um, that you'd like to point to of, of, of that kind of very specific change that leads to an a, a a shift to equalizing the opportunities afforded people. Absolutely, one of my favorite victories was um, bringing together community coalition, inner city struggle, um, my girls for action, brother son selves. About ten years ago now, uh, we figured out that actually the young folks, young black and brown boys really helped us to see that one of the biggest barriers to graduating high school was suspension and expulsion. And we saw very low graduation rates for that those groups. And so if you sort of trace back, what is the key trigger that leads to kids not being able to graduate? And it turned out to be suspensions and expulsions for um, a reason called willful defiance, which is basically undefined. It was sort of a subjective feeling that a teacher or principal might have that this person is just willfully defying the rules. So let's kick them out. And obviously schools and classrooms don't have the resources they need to deal with the range of behavioral challenges, especially that low income folks are facing. And so they were, you know, suspending and expelling these kids, mostly black and brown boys. And that suspension increased their chances of going to jail by, you know, massively, not just going to jail, being homeless or getting a low wage job later. And so we figured if we could stop suspensions for willful defiance, then we could increase graduation rates and decrease incarceration rates. So let me just go through this. So both my parents worked through my entire childhood. 
if I go to school and I just being a, a pain in the butt that day and I'm tossed out for, for willful defiance, what am I going to do? My parents well, are. Good, good right? question. You what probably would not be tossed out for willful defiance, right? The, the people that were targeted by willful defiance was black and brown boys. Right. But to your point, yes, what are you going to do? What is the, the only thing that does is get the person out of the classroom. It doesn't help the kid. It doesn't give them an opportunity to succeed, learn, and thrive. And, uh, and I'm not an evil more person, vulnerable right? If, 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 if I'm just being an idiot that day, I'm not an evil person, right? So now my parents can't pick me up. I'm, I'm, I'm hanging out. I'm not doing it. I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm out for a while. I don't tell my parents or my parents get a notice later or something like that. Right. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't improve things at all. Exactly. What is the point? It doesn't help the kid learn different behavior. It doesn't give the kid any resources. It just leads them to jail. And, um, so folks fought really hard for, for years, and Liberty Hill was a huge part of this too, but it was really the, the young people who were affected by these decisions that were on the front lines. They were the ones talking to the media. They were the ones talking to the legislators, in that case, the school board, and they were able to get this uh, reason for suspension removed. So no longer could anyone be removed for willful defiance, which led to a decrease in suspension rates of over 70%, mostly impacting black and brown boys. Uh, and but it's taken 10 years just this week. The governor finally signed the legislation to codify this in state law, not just in the L.A.'s uh, L.A. region. And that took 10 years for something so basic. But when you start to trace, you look at, you know, why are so many black people in jail? And you start to go upstream to look at the causes. You can find these really specific moments when they are being kicked out of the systems that are meant to help them. What you're saying, what you're both saying is that if you look at our system and you say that we're not the perfect union, we are trying to become a more perfect union, there are things we can improve. But to improve things, we have to think differently. Willful defiance might be a vague, you know, logical, this, per, you know, whatever, but the impact is so negative, Right that you have to start thinking differently and, and maybe you have to resource differently and so on. Let's talk a little bit about how do you get people who don't think like you do currently on board? One of, the, one of my biggest problems with people with various positions, they don't talk to each other if the positions are different, right? How do you engage with others who look at this, they might call themselves, uh, you know, a different political movement or party or philosophy or whatever. But those people also have valid points that you have to hear. They have to hear your points. How do you how do you do that? Or are you or, or, or is it like, have you given up? And uh, <laughs> Julio? I, I don't think we've given up. Um, I, I, I do think you bring up what is evident in every issue you bring up, whether it's around education, you're going to have folks on the charter side, you're going to have folks on the public school side, you're, you know, think about just the, the narrative around LGBT, specific, specifically the T right now across this country, that is ever present, Mark. And the reality is, is that that's why narrative power is so essential, right? Part of why Liberty Hill invests in organizations and really invests in people power and relationship power and every other form of power is really to ensure that voices that are often um, not heard, you know, are, are lifted up. And so I'll give you one example. Um, after the murder of George Floyd, you know, Shane's already talked about this. Um, there were more eyeballs on justice and how injustice was playing out in black brown communities across this country. I think, you know, millions and millions of people witnessed George Floyd um, being murdered. And, and so what happened after that was a realization, Mark, that the criminal legal system was broken. You could ask people and you could bring in folks from the left and the right, and they could say, I know someone who's been caught up in the criminal legal system. So it, there started to be a little bit more empathy and, and how it played out in LA where, Again, we were already gaining traction in, in Los Angeles County to really, you know, unfortunately, Los Angeles was known um, for being number one for all the wrong reasons. We were the biggest punishment system in the world. We had the biggest um, county jail. We had more youth prisons than any jurisdiction in the country. And yet in 2017, um, you know, Liberty Hill joined many other organizations, other foundations 
to really change that narrative. We wanted to be the biggest investor in, in, in people in Los Angeles. That was not easy, as you can imagine, because again, when you turn on the news, you're looking at smash and grabs. You're thinking that you're unsafe. You're thinking that- I want to be safe. Of- you want to be safe, right? So yeah, you say, and- okay, I got to, I, you know- and, and so what, what started to happen is that, you know, people started to then lean in and talk about what can we do different in Los Angeles. And so after the murder of George Floyd, again, as a reminder, L.A. County, home to 10 million people, the budget of Los Angeles County is forty four billion dollars. Right. Forty four billion dollars. Uh, again, L.A. is larger than 44 other states. And of that forty four billion dollars, about 10 billion of it was being earmarked for law enforcement. So are you talking about, are you talking about, um, I, I want to be careful here because we have this dialogue, which to me has always seemed to be very odd, right? Yes. This whole idea of defunding law enforcement or funding this or funding that. And to me, it seems like we're all looking at the same problem. So I think the whole issue is um, how do you use the money wisely in a balanced way, right? It's not who gets the biggest slice. It's how the slices of of that money pie can have impact that is desired. I want to be safe on my streets. I'm okay with that going to law enforcement I'm okay with that going to education and and uh, programs to help uh, homeless people. I want to see a good balance so that I'm safe. Absolutely. If it all goes to one or all goes to the other, I'm not going to feel safe because it doesn't really address the problem in any kind of balanced way. Is that what is that your so, approach, or how, so, how do you see it? Yeah. So ex- I think what you just played out, Mark, is exactly think about what you, how you played it out, and now think about how millions and millions of people in Los Angeles play that out. Including we, we, the people who are homeless, who also want to be They want to be safe. They want access to healthy foods. They want access right. to parks and recreation. They, We all want that. But again, I'm going to challenge you, Mark. I'm going to tell you that it is not a fair distribution of resources when you're spending $10 billion in resources and you're not spending $10 billion in education, which is the biggest predictor of creating safety in communities. Right. How so what you're saying is it comes down to the ability, ultimately, to be self-sufficient, to earn a living and so on. If you don't have the education for that, you're 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 for for 20 years. I worked at the California Wellness Foundation and we studied what were the drivers of violence. And we took a public health approach to addressing violence. You don't address violence by simply investing in law enforcement who actually don't prevent crime. Good jobs, safe neighborhoods, safe housing, uh, all, all create more safety. And the reason I'm bringing this up, because you, you talked about how do we have these conversations at scale? After the murder of George Floyd, people realize, wow, we are spending $10 billion of resources and we still don't feel safe. So now we need to refund the community. So the it's like community- 22% of the L.A. budget, right? Yeah. And that's for the county. And if you look at the L.A. city budget, you know, we spent about three billion dollars for LAPD. And I believe the LAPD budget and Shane, you helped me out here because you were on the LAPD commission. It's probably more than 50 percent of the city budget. Really? Or more. Wow. Shane? What? Yeah, I mean, I think the one of the underlying misperceptions here is is about what creates safety, as Julio said. And the reality is that, for example, Sending people to jail, most people who go to jail get out, right? Most people serve a sentence and they get out. And during their time in jail, they are abused and traumatized and, and not, you know, inevitably turn out worse than they went in. And think about this for kids. It's even much worse. You know, kids go into jail for some small infraction that you would never dream of jailing someone for, really. And then they come out and their life trajectory is completely changed. And so... The, I think it's it's a misunderstanding of what keeps us safe. Sending kids to jail doesn't keep us safe. C- connecting kids to resources, to, to secure housing, to education, to caring adults, to mental health services, to sports, to all that stuff, that's what's going to keep them safe. And the idea that funding more and more police is going to keep us safe is just, it's just, there's no evidence of that. And if, 
You have allies in law enforcement. How? How? Because you know, look. Let let's let's be real, right? If 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 money uh, is limited, and you've got to make investment decisions, right? People in law enforcement, if if you have um, those funds uh, allocated to um, to other types of activities, um, intervention activities on the mm-hmm. street, education activities, and so on and so forth. What you end up with is a scramble over resources, and then things get really tough, right? People start to to fight with each other. Um, is there a way to bring people together and and form a consensus on 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 how to deal with these things? Is it in the interest of 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 some law enforcement folks to see things your way and become allies? What do you what have you experienced? Yeah, I mean, in organizing, we like to say there's no permanent allies and no permanent enemies. And so while there may be deep disagreements between um, those of us, you know, on this side of things and and law enforcement folks, what I was fascinated by when I served on the LA, the police commission for the LAPD was seeing that police officers actually love the idea of diversion. So this is when, particularly in the case of kids, a kids a kid gets uh, encounters a police officer. Instead of the police officer arresting the kid, they send them to a community organization and they get services, they get restorative justice. So if they have committed an offense, they get held accountable and they have an opportunity to repair it. The victim has an opportunity to get some accountability or some support. Um, and it turns out cops love this because the cops on the beat every day pushing their black and whites, they see that when they arrest a kid, no good comes of it. That kid's going to come right back on the street and it, the kid's going to be worse off time and time again. And the cops don't want that. They want these kids to thrive too. But they just didn't have an alternative. Once we started introducing diversion, they loved it. They loved the idea that this kid could actually get long-term help and that they might never see them again. And so I do think that, and I think we see a similar thing with, uh, well, I think there's those opportunities on all of our issues is finding those points of agreement and alliance to win the kinds of policy victories that may not change all the hearts and minds, but they codify a change that then we can fight to protect so that conditions on the ground will change, even if people's hearts and minds don't change right away. That was my experience in New York City when I worked for the Child Welfare Administration. My experience was is that no police officer wanted to get involved in a family situation. No police officer um, uh, uh, wanted necessarily to be involved in in removals or in in uh, in in family uh, altercations or in abuse and neglect because that's not their training, right? So yeah. the collaboration that we had with law enforcement was absolutely phenomenal uh and and there was a a um, mutual respect that is kind of foundational do you see it that way as well you know i'm going to add because first of all i don't think shane gets enough credit um you know for the the head of the liberty hill foundation which has been in existence for 40 years supporting community organizing to take a position and a post as a commissioner for the la police department was not for the faint of heart so but again, this is another example. Your own constituents, right, Shane? Was we're like, uh, what are you doing? And this again is what Liberty Hill is. We are going to do things that no one else is going to do, right? Because I think again, Shane does. She doesn't get enough credit, and she got a lot of flack and a lot of heat and a lot of fire for for that position. And yet, think about the role that she played. So when we talk about govern a uh, power, what Shane had was governance power. She was on one of the most powerful commissions in all of Los Angeles County and all of city of Los Angeles. It's a city of LA commission, right? And yet now we now have a new department of youth development where their core strategy is countywide diversion. So when Shane was piloting diversion, we were, you know, diverting a couple hundred hundred kids. We're now diverting and have the potential to divert tens of thousands of young people. So I'm going to give you one statistic in 2017 in LA County, we arrested about 17,000 kids under the age of 18. 17,000 in LA County. Under the age of 18. Last year's data, which is the most recent data set, that number was about 3,000. So think about that decline. So you go from 17,000 young people who would have been arrested, who would have been booked, who would have been put in a juvenile hall, who would have been traumatized, who would have had to work harder to get back into school, reunified with their family and all of that. Those 
we've we've significantly dropped that to 3000 and we still can get down lower because there's still a lot of law enforcement agencies that don't actually believe in diversion just yet because it's not mandatory it, it is at the discretion of law enforcement to actually divert a young people who's eligible so again i bring this up because again shane's engagement on the commission was able to bring to light data information from the very communities that we were supporting right so when you think about the kids that were being pushed out from school that's what liberty hill was doing it was collecting this information and then figuring out how to use and leverage our power to change policy to change systems so that that no longer was going to happen moving forward we're now changing the narrative mark on the youth side for being the biggest punishment system to being the biggest investor right we now hope that our department of youth development is that billion dollar agency versus what used to be probation and every other law enforcement agency and other you know law enforcement officials will say yes we want to invest in wraparound services for young people we want them to succeed because number one this is your future homeowner this is your future taxpayer this is your future business owner and if we're literally locking them up and i'm saying black brown native kids we're going to have a significant issue in Los Angeles County when we are a dominant people of color county. And America shoots itself in the foot, right? I mean, you know, that's uh, our, our young people are our greatest treasure, our greatest opportunity for growth, our greatest uh, asset. Uh, Shane, you want to take us out? This has been uh, phenomenal. And Julio, that, what a great example. What a phenomenal example uh, that you cite. Kudos to uh, to those across the system. Right in law enforcement, you uh, you commissioners, uh, Liberty Hill, uh, for collaborating on creating such a huge impact. Shane, uh, you want to have the last word? Thank you. I would love to. First of all, I never tire of hearing Julio talk about the work. So thanks for joining us, Julio. Uh, and Mark, I love this podcast and I love your approach. I have a lot to learn from it for Liberty Hills podcast, which I would love to take a moment to promote. Uh, we discuss issues like this and many more with the organizers and community leaders who are on the front lines of these fights every day. And our podcast is called Conversations from the Front Lines. And you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. So I encourage everyone to check out this awesome uh, Liberty Hill podcast and visit our website at libertyhill.org if you want to learn more about the organizers we support and the campaigns we work on. Um, yeah, just thank you, Mark, for using your platform to uplift these issues. Not enough folks do that. Oh, it's, it's, it's such a pleasure. Shane Murphy Goldsmith, President and CEO, and Julio Marcial, Senior Vice President of Programs of the Liberty Hill Foundation. Thank you so much for your wonderful work, for informing us, for helping us to understand how our actions on an everyday basis can actually affect others in positive ways. Thank your donors. Thank your staffs. Thank, your, thank the people you serve. Thank your collaborators. Thank your uh, grantees. Uh, it's it's just been such a wonderful program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so much.